Okay, we have two presentations before we're done. Uh, the first one is uh, I'm going to give a. Uh, I think it's two. Let me double check. Yes, I'm going to give the uh, fee, uh, uh, free st fee structure discussion, and then Vint Cerf, our chairman of the board, will do our board of trustees report. So uh, I'm going to talk about the fee structure review process and what was produced. Uh, and then we'll have a little time for questions, uh, recognizing that we still have Vint's report and an open mic for everything else. So fee structure review panel. Um, the last time we changed our fee schedule, which was, in, uh, was discussed in uh, 2012, and we changed in 2013, uh, people said, well, you just did an incremental change, and we're not even sure if that's the right approach. A lot of philosophical questions came up about how the fees should actually be structured, not what a particular line should look like. So we uh, impaneled a fee structure review panel to consider various long-term fee structures that were suggested by the community on the topic and summarize the pros and cons back to the Aaron Borden community. Uh, this draft report of the fee structure review panel is complete. It's a balanced document uh, describing each of the approaches on how Aaron might structure its fees going forward. We actually use the full year numbers from 2013 to model, so we actually have in the report uh, what the current membership would look like and the current fees and revenues would look like for each of the proposals. Um, and then uh, it provides a common basis for discussion of the merits of the various approaches. It does not provide a recommendation. The goal was let's model these and see what they look like and let the community discuss what they think of that. Uh, covers seven alternative approaches for, actually six alternatives and the current baseline for Aaron's recovery of costs in all contracted parties for registration services in a fair and equitable manner. Um, the members of the panel, uh, Paul Anderson, Aaron Hughes, Bill Woodcock, myself, and then we uh, called from the community and at-large members, Tim St. Pierre, Steve Feldman, Brandon Ross, Daniel Alexander, and Mike Sinatra. Because the fee structure uh, committee did its job and produced a report and is now concluded, I'd like a round of applause for these people. <clears throat> Hopefully their report will prove useful in the discussion. Um, the report was sent out last month uh, to uh, Aaron Discuss and Aaron PPML. You can get it online. There's a URL on this presentation that links to that message. Um, it covers, as I said, the current fee structure and uh, six proposals. Um, there's a short summary of each proposal, what it, what it proposes, what the pros and cons would be. And I've actually included them in this presentation but if you go to the actual document, you will find an appendix for each one of these proposals. And each appendix has the full detail of the proposal and the actual fee table for each one and the modeling against the current membership, or actually the 2013 membership, and a graph showing what it looks like as a histogram of the fees as applied to the membership. So there's a, quite a few pages to the document. I'm only going to go through the summary of each of these. Um, the, uh, we're going to open up a community consultation next week. Uh, we will uh, have it on Aaron Consult. It'll be available to anyone, member, non-member, to participate and uh, to re read this document, give your thoughts about what direction, if any, Aaron should take. It's not inevitable that we have to change the structure of the fee schedule. But if you want to take it in a certain direction, Here's six possible directions, and you can, you can advocate for one and explain why. Um, I'll say at the end of that process, I'll summarize all of that. I'll bring it back to the Aaron Finance Committee, uh, the Board of Trustees Finance Committee. They're the ones who actually make recommendations to the full board for any fee schedule changes. Uh, so they would be the ones that set staff off in a direction to develop a specific fee schedule for everyone to consider. So it'll be community consultation, summarize the Aaron FinCom, and then if they direct me to model an alternative, I'll model one uh, and bring it to you folks. Um, so the current fee schedule, and I think everyone knows the current fee schedule, but I'm going to summarize really quickly. We charge, we have two different ways of, of having fees. One is for service providers who pay an annual registration services subscription, and one is for end users that pay a fixed maintenance fee based on the number of records. Legacy holders pay under the end user fee schedule, recognizing that most legacy holders have a cap. They can only be pay, they can only charge uh, 
NATO, we're 125 this year, going to 150. There's a cap in the LRSA that says it's $100, it can go up 25 per year. We've raised it once. So legacy holders pay as end users for their records, uh, and there's a cap, but over time that will slowly ramp up as we raise that to match other members. Okay, ISPs pay based on an annual amount based on the service category that accommodates both their V4 and V6 holdings. So there is a tier, and based on where you fit in V4 and V6, whatever category will meet both of your holdings is what you pay. Um, and uh, the fees step uh, going from $500 a year up to $32,000 a year. Organizations with larger holdings pay that top category, XX Lodge, for $32,000 a year. And that's also all in an appendix in the report. The benefits are simplicity. Uh, based on the size of your holdings, you're in a simple category. You can budget it every year. Um, if you get resources, unless you get a lot of resources, you don't necessarily change. So it's fairly predictable. When you do get a lot of resources, yes, it could move to a different category. Um, it provides a single fee that covers both V4 and V6, which means everyone who has a V4 resource, resources can get V6 without necessarily having their fees change. Now, you may not get the amount of V6 you like, and that's a question, but you can, everyone can get V6 without any corresponding change in fees for some size of V6. Uh, there's a problem at the bottom end of the scale, which one of these talks about. And uh, the simplicity uh, also means if we want to change fees, it's very easy to change one table of fees, lower them. We've lowered the fees uh, several times over the years. Um, so that's the current schedule. The concerns, a couple of concerns that were cited that kicked off this process. The larger 17 Aaron members actually have more space than the top tier. And they may not be paying, if we had an infinite number of tiers, they wouldn't, may not be paying what people would expect for the size of their holdings. Additionally, the present fee structure um, is interesting in that it provides benefits for ISPs because uh, versus end users. If you have a, if you're an end user with a lot of resources and you're paying $100 each, you could end up paying more than a small ISP. On the other hand, if you're an ISP, once you have an ISP, you pay a fixed fee regardless of how many address blocks you have. So there's a little bit of advantage to both categories. There's a difference between end users and ISPs, even though there's not necessarily a difference in the services we provide. Quite frankly, uh, address blocks and registry maintenance is extremely similar with a very small number of exceptions that are very hard to account for. So we have two different categories now and it's not clear whether or not that's, uh, there's a reason for that. And then um, there's some concern about the alignment, as I said, between V4 and V6. Presently, if you go to get IPv6, um, because of the current categories, uh, if you get a, something allowed by policy, you will end up seeing an increase in your fees. These fees are lower than they were in 2012, but it's still a net increase. Okay, so here are the proposals, okay? Proposal one's the current one. Proposal two, first, very simple. Extend those V4 categories. Add XX Lodge and XX Lodge. Actually, the table's very nice. It actually has XX Lodge, XX, XX Lodge. Huge, XX huge, XXX huge. It goes all the way down to any possible address holding. But realistically, it only affects about 20 members of Aaron. The fees keep going up. And so we'd end up with fees of 124, uh, 164 and 128,000. Is this appropriate? If you feel that people with large resource holders, holdings need to pay uh, more, it might be. But recognize that an address block in the registry actually doesn't really cost that much more to Aaron in terms of our actual costs. You're really uh, charging more because someone sees more value to it. Um, and also, um, the more our fees are based on V4 holdings, long term, we have to worry about what happens when V4 goes away. So if you have all this revenue and everything's great, and then 10 years from now everyone returns their V4 block, you get to see everyone's category drop precipitously down because everyone is sitting in V6. So you may not want to drink the Kool-Aid even if you want it, so there's some pros and cons. Okay, another issue, realign IPv6. And this is basically addressing that XX small issue. Basically by taking the lowest tiers of the IPv6 category and having them start three tiers up so you can get an address block of reasonable size 
up to a 32 without paying anything more, you don't have to take a smaller V6 block. This has been cited by people as a way of um, preventing a V6 discouragement that we currently have in that if you're the smallest ISP category, you'll pay more to get V6. And we, we're not trying to do that, so we should fix it. Note that there's a counterpoint, which is that, again, long term, a lot of people end up in V6 in very small categories. And if everyone ends up in the bottom category, then long term, we need to know what it looks like modeling, yes, modeling for um, the, uh, the fee schedule. So as it says here, a reevaluation of this policy may be needed when IPv4 usage is in decline to determine if revenue will be heavily impacted. Okay, the uh, a proposal, the next proposal is linear IPv4 categories, uh, which creates granular categories uh, which go uh, linearly up and down to all sizes, uh, and it means that uh, at the top end it's a $400,000 fee for the largest address holders, um, and uh, it's believed to be a very equitable and fair if you want to base it on holdings. And uh, in terms of concerns, uh, obviously the largest fees in those categories uh, would be a surprise to people who got those invoices the first year we sent them out. So we're thinking about. Algorithmic. Um, it's been noted that some people, rather than having discrete categories, one way to solve this and be quite proportional would be use a formula-based model based on total al uh, address allocations. And so this was modeled, um, and it provides a very smooth increase uh, as resource holdings increase. The analysis is in the, uh, uh, full, the uh, full document. Uh, the good news is that um, it rises proportionate. It would be very simple to change total revenues by adjusting the fee. Uh, we know other regions, APNIC has experimented with this. Um, the concerns, of course, is that uh, we need to make sure that the, whatever we model matches our revenue increase, so the formula needs to be tweaked the first time to do that. And the fee amounts don't fit neat buckets, so you'll end up with invoices of not round amounts, and they'll vary on any resource change. And so some organizations have indicated a budgeting issue with that. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, the next proposal would be a member-based fee proposal, and this is based on uh, looking at a, a flat membership for all Aaron organizations that encompass everything Aaron does. And uh, this excludes, uh, this is based whether you're an end user or an ISP, you include it all in the membership's fee, everyone pays the same fee. If we actually counted all organizations using Aaron services, uh, either V4 or V6, um, then we could actually set an annual fee of $1,400 a year. It would be completely independent of your resource holdings. Everyone would pay the same. Um, very easy um, to handle. Um, it would be a, a relatively low cost number for many organizations, of course, not for all. Um, nearly all end users under this model, rather than paying $100 per resource per year, would see an increase in what their current invoice is. Um, the fairness of this presumes that everyone benefits equally from Aaron, or that the industry benefits equally, and everyone should pay. And that is not necessarily the case. Um, it's an indirect function, and so we have to, we have to decide is how important is it is to be equal among all of us. Many organizations have different fees based on different sizes. Um, if you take that last model and you try to lower the fees to the lowest number you can and break out discrete transaction costs, you end up with a transaction fee-based proposal where we have a single flat fee for everyone and significant fees for transactions, because we know people who come in and do transactions with Aaron do end up with us incurring costs. Uh, under this proposal, the fee would be $880 a year. In addition to this, the per transaction fees would be established for new resources and uh, resource transfer requests at $1,900 and $3,800 respectively. These would be reviewed, could be reviewed and adjusted annually. Um, registry holders would have a very low cost fee. Everyone would pay the same. Transaction fees would make sure the parties incurring costs to Aaron would, would pay them. Um, we don't need to have a, it solves the end user versus ISP fee structure, and it would dramatically increase uh, Aaron membership. Everyone would be a member, end users, ISPs of all categories. Um, 
The increase of cost to everyone would still be a concern. Um, we would need to make sure that we are collecting appropriately so we don't go through all the work of a transaction and have someone then not pay the fee and give up on the transaction. And there's a perception issue um, that the people who aren't using Aaron very frequently are subsidizing those who use Aaron more frequently, even if it's not through transactions, it's just through help desk requests and calling in, et cetera. So those are the, the proposals, uh, and they go different directions. And now we're going to be able to have a, a consultation out to the community. There's some discussion topics in the report, and these are sort of some of the issues that are raised. Um, and uh, some of the proposals propose significantly higher fees for larger numbers. Aaron's costs are proportionate to address blocks and transactions, not discrete addresses. Is it equitable? We're looking for equitable recovery. Is it equitable? Aaron's mission to improve the business conditions of ISPs in the entire internet community via management of number resources in the region is a service to the entire industry. It's not services to individual organizations. Um, does the argue of cost recovery should reflect the flat fee or not? Furthermore, trade associations, some of them scale their membership based on the size of the participant. Is this better done based on re revenue or budget by approximate of Aaron's fee structure does through total address holdings today? One of the questions that comes up is, should Aaron pursue a more service transaction-based fee approach? If we take that, do we need to change what Aaron is? Aaron is a trade association for the betterment of the industry. And if we actually get specific about providing services and charging people specific recovery, then you actually leave the trade association category and you look like you're providing a for-profit business. And so that's a directional change that could have an organizational change. And then um, the vast IPv6 address space allows for very large blocks, and um, there's very few counter pressures to that, causing people to right size their v6 block. Um, is that an issue or not? Should we even worry about that? And should the structure, fee be structured for convenience rather than to encourage efficient utilization? So these topics are also in the, pa in the uh, paper. Uh, microphones are open for comments. And we're going to remember, we're going to have an online consultation for the next 60 days. So people want to talk about one of those proposals or one of the issues raised? Go ahead, front and center. Matt Petak, one quick question on this. You make it sound like there are seven proposals, and the consultation will be which of the seven does the community prefer? Is there an option for mix and match and saying we like oh, yeah. bullet it's, point it's, of one? And it's, okay. it's an open. This is just a discussion document, so you can start by saying, I'm looking at number three with this change, or number four and this, or half of six and half of two, whatever you want. We just wanted to have a framework because this covers probably 80% of what people want to do. Excellent. Okay? Yes, uh, center, middle. Adam Thompson, Manitoba Internet Exchange. Um, <clears throat> going back to something you said uh, before you got into the proposals was the mention that there is increasingly, and we're not quite there yet, not that much difference between ISPs and end users. And I've already had this argument with other people earlier this week, and I will iterate on the public record that my experience is with the smaller organization end of the scale, and at the small end of the scale, there is no difference anymore. Um, I would encourage, strongly encourage, Aaron to look at gradually homogenizing those two categories wherever possible. Uh, to eliminate confusion and needless distinctions. Um, if that proceeds, then Proposal 6 makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, Proposal 6 will kind of happen by default if the distinction between ISP and end users is eliminated. Um, thank you. One little note. Services-wise, it is true that ISPs have the ability to do sub-delegations um, and it's not clear that that's available to end users. We've had discussions on occasion. We've talked to people about that. We, we try not to highlight the distinction. And particularly, for example, you have a legacy holder who's paying end user fees but has existing subdelegations. You don't want to have to force them to be an ISP. So it's not even a universal black and white line. But in general, 97% of Aaron's services look the same regardless of the type of your address block, correct? Yes, a center middle. Owen DeLong, Black Lotus Communications, uh, speaking actually for myself as DeLong and DeLong Z. 
Um, I wasn't thrilled when my fees went from $100 a year to $300 a year under the last go around. I'm certainly not finding any appeal whatsoever in proposal number six where my fees would go to $1,400 a year. So I would argue that the distinction at the small end, uh, because I'm about as small as you can get, um, I'm running an AS out of a house, um, is not a distinction without a difference. It's a very, very meaningful distinction, and I would argue against said elimination. Understood. Uh, Senator Middle, go ahead. Uh, Brian Johnson with DRN. Um, uh, relative to uh, the proposal seven, um, transaction-based, would that include transactions that are automated transactions as well as person-to-person -person transactions? So the, the reason this was discussed is because it was a question of fairness of recovery, and that's based on labor and labor categories. And so, no, I presume if this is, if we have to have a team doing a review and doing processing and working with you on the paperwork, this should correspond to the work involved. That was the impetus behind it. We'd obviously have to do an actual fee schedule, but presumably automated transactions would have very little cost as long as they have very little pe people involved. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Front. Uh, Rob Seastrom, Air and Advisory Council, Time Warner Cable, RES-Z. <laughs> that dash Z means that I'm an LRSA signatory. Uh, when I was an LR, when I became an LRSA signatory, the modest amount of money that was charged on an annual basis was intended to be something that made sure that there was a contractual um, uh, relationship there, and that the client uh, um, service provider relationship with Aaron was exercised on a frequent uh, basis. It was intended to be a token amount of money. I advocated heavily for a lot of folks to sign LRSAs on that basis. Certainly, my ability to do that with a straight face is in the, in, inversely proportional to the amount of money that's being charged. And if were it to go to 300, okay, fine, like, oh, and I'm not particularly pleased by this, but it is what it is. If it were go to, to go to 14, my ability to advocate for that would be asymptotic to zero. Just to be clear, the people who have entered those agreements, those, many of them have caps that specifically say they can only increase $25 per year. So it the, would, the, the cap is on the rate, not on the ultimate uh, um, amount. Not on the ultimate number. And, and, and uh, shame on us for, for not insisting on that at the time that the LRSA was under discussion. Do you believe there should be an in perpetuity difference in fees for LRSA holders? That's a good question. It's it's uh, worthy that, of discussion. That, that's I, I haven't the question to be discussed. I haven't I haven't thought it, thought that okay. through particularly, but uh, I haven't really been incented to until people started talking about orders of magnitude difference in what I might be paying as LRSA. Understood. Yeah, excellent comment. Thank you. Uh, center middle. Uh, Milton Mueller, Syracuse University, and Aaron Advisory Council. Um, I'm curious about the legal change that you noted uh, might be required, uh, the um, fee for services versus the business league model. Um, I wonder how complicated and how, uh, how that might affect uh, membership in the organization. To the extent that Aaron is a 503c6, um, we're focused on improving the environment of a particular business or industry. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to do that for the entire industry. To the extent that we collect fees from our community and we do that for the entire industry, it's very straightforward. If we collect keys, fees from individual organizations and we attribute those to services to those individual organizations and that set of service revenue increases um, and it's tied to our costs, there's a threshold where someone would say that is an activity that isn't a trade association activity, it's probably a more classic business activity. And so it's, uh, it's a judgment call. Um, we, actually, um, we actually have had our, our current structure and our tax status reviewed even recently and found we're golden, we're fine as is. But if we took a direction specifically with the fee schedule that was to try to attribute a cost service relationship and try to do it for a significant amount of Aaron's revenue, we'd probably have to revisit that. And it's not, it's not a difficult thing, but it might mean a subsidiary to do just that and handling the relationships between the two 
It just adds, there's an overhead complication, I guess, that people would need to think about. Obviously, if a fee schedule brings us in a direction that we need to worry about, we get appropriate counsel and figure out how to do it. Okay, and, and as a follow-up question to that, I'm just curious as to the, do you, how much do you know and how much can you tell us about the cost drivers uh, of Aaron's services? Oh, yes. Actually, we put all of that in the same document. Uh, if you go to Appendix uh, C of the doc document, you'll find the current schedule. You'll find that about 50% of our costs today are attributed to registry services related registry development, registry services. About 10% um, is organizational. It's the members meeting and the elections and the board of trustees and the legal overhead. Uh, we have about 8% for internet governance. Um, and then about 20 to 30% is ongoing registry operations. It's literally keeping the lights and the power fed to the servers as opposed to registry development and policy meetings. That is in the schedule so you can go pull it down in the report. Uh, center middle. Mike Burns, IP Trading, <coughs> an AC candidate. In APNIC, transfer fees are tied to the size of the transfer. In Aaron, <coughs> it's a flat fee. And in the proposal that combined a, a member fee with a, a transfer fee, it looked to be also a flat fee. I'd like to point out that uh, a fee increase of this size is a counter incentive to small transfers and would more than double the size I'm sorry, double the, the cost of uh, the smallest transfers. So it's real disincentive to that. And it, uh, tied to that point, um, the, the idea of having members pay equally certainly has an egalitarian appeal. And combined with the fact that the cost of a, of a registry entry with a slash 9 at the end of it is the same to you as a slash 24. However, in this case, the slash nine has a huge financial asset value sure. absent from the slash 24. And I think in that context, it makes sense to have larger holders of resources pay larger fees. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna close the mics. Oh. Yeah, if I can just add a few points. Oh, sorry, Go ahead. Is that next? Mics are closed, but last person. Oh. Well, yeah, a few points uh, I just want to make. First, I just want to reiterate, I guess, what John said is that, you know, the purpose of this process was based on um, a bunch of feedback that occurred on one of the mailing lists that maybe once we changed our fee model last time, we didn't have the right one. Um, you know, from our standpoint, the current fee model is recovering costs. You know, we're not saying that the fee model has to change in the near future. So I, I point that out. This was more about a discussion about equitable uh, and I don't believe the committee is really recommending any specific one this was just trying to enumerate some some straw men uh, a second point on the whole end user versus ISP one change that I think a lot of people forget that we m did make in the last fee schedule was while end users generally pay a fee every time they make a request and then pay a maintenance fee and that's generally stayed the same although I know we, we now charge a bit more uh, on the maintenance fees the subscription fee model changed more significantly. The last model that we had, ISPs were charged based on what their, for lack of a better term, peak request was right. per year. In other words, if you came for a, 20, a 16 every year, you were in the category that charged a 16. We've switched that significantly now to just what is your total holding. So I think right. that's why we're seeing more discussion about uh, why an end user um, versus um, ISP may look more and more similar, at least from a fee uh, perspective. And by the way, just because they may become the same thing in a fee perspective doesn't mean that they won't stay separate in a, in a policy pr perspective. Uh, perspective. And uh, I would ur urge, uh, Rob, for you to uh, encourage any of those discussions that you can and how can we best, you know, I don't think we're trying to discourage, and others have said we don't want to discourage people from uh, signing LRSRA, so if there's ways that we could um, deal with that. We'd love to hear feedback on that. So, hope that's so helpful. people will see the announcement of the consultation go out. We'll keep it open. It's a pretty sizable topic. We'll keep it open for 60 days. The folks who feel strongly that one of these is a good direction or that nothing is a good direction should get on Aaron Consult and, and participate. As I said, I'll summarize that for the Aaron Board, uh, Aaron Board Finance Committee. Thank you very much.